Excellent. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to all those, especially in Asia, staying up very late for this event. Uh, welcome back to the 2021 EPIC Symposium. I hope some of you had the chance to attend the first day of panels. They were really interesting, discussing the South China Sea, discussing multilateralism and how China and the US and Russia fall into place. But this session is called uh, Beyond the Galvan Valley, and it's about the future of India and China relations. It is part of our series of expert-led small group discussions designed to break the wall between panelists and audience and really get to the crux of the conversation. And I would like to introduce our panelists for whom, as I said, I'm tremendously grateful for, for agreeing to join us at such short notice. First, we have uh, Pratik Joshi, who is pursuing his uh, PhD from St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford. His research deals with the intellectual history of Indian foreign policy. Thank you so much for joining us, Pratik. And next we have Aman Thakkar, who is the senior program manager at Indiaspora and, and an adjunct fellow with the Wadwani chair in the US India policy studies for the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. Thank you so much for joining us, Aman. I'm also, I'm also uh, extremely delighted to introduce the topic, the troubled India-China conflict, which was reignited with full force as a result of the 2020 Galwan Valley clash that killed 20 Indian soldiers and an unspecified number of Chinese soldiers has dragged on with little promise. Over the last month, there have been promising signs of disengagement of troops at the Pangong Tso uh, as a culmination of a series of diplomatic rounds last year. However, uh, other regions along the line of actual control, such as Depsang, remain hotly contested by both countries. Furthermore, the border tensions have since manifested into economic sanctions placed by India against Chinese technology, goods, and mobile applications. Chinese aggression has also pushed India to strategically align with the Quad, consisting of the United States, Japan, and Australia. Adding to this, the ever-present effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have altered the balance between the two countries and have ushered a rethink in military spending. With this in mind, this session hopes to trace how we got here, what the current points of contention are, and where we go from here. I will begin by allowing Pratik and Aman to share their introductory remarks and their perspectives on the points of contention today, after which the audience may raise their hand to ask a question. So the raise hand feature is in the reactions on your Zoom tab. Uh, or you could also drop a question in the chat feature and you could choose to remain anonymous by sending it directly to me as well. So without further ado, uh, Pratik, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Arjun, for such a wonderful uh, introduction. I'm very happy to uh, participate. And uh, I also thank Uzair for, for uh, putting my name. Uh, so beginning uh, with, with my uh, introduction, so how many minutes do I have, if you could give it a rough estimate? And I'll let's, let's start with five, but I know you have uh, a lot more to share as well. I'll, I'll try to limit it in five. So, uh, I, I, so I'll begin with slightly uh, disappointing note that um, I have a very unacademic way of looking at things. And I do admit I don't have a methodological or, or a theoretical training because I am an area studies person. Uh, now, what, what, what happens with that is uh, I rely on 50, 60 different people who ranging from policymakers to think tankers to people who are in the system, who were in the system, who are about to go into the system. Uh, what 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 I do with that is I triangulate that information and I have a very interesting conjecture to share. Uh, this is something which has not been uh, say publicly debated or or accepted. But uh, uh, what what happened is uh, now if if I elongate the time span, which is you have uh, increasing China-Pakistan cooperation, you have India's orientations towards the Americans, the Quad and all these things, they are quite well known. But yes, uh, we all again know that Article 370 and the change in Kashmir's, uh, this status becomes a trigger when the Indian leadership says that we will reclaim back both parts of Kashmir which have been taken by the Chinese and, and by the Pakistanis. 
and then uh, there is this talk of two front war when the indian army chief at multiple occasions especially from general rawat onwards so you see the intensity going up uh, on on the possibility of two front warfare which may may not be true but at the same time the specter was created and it was very well accepted uh, what it has done is uh, that uh, when so if you if you see what happens from 2016 onwards you have the first surgical strikes and then in 2019 you have the second surgical strikes and then at the same time you have the talk of a second you have the talk of a two front war and finally you have kashmir status being changed where it clubs uh, india pakistan and china especially china and pakistan from from the perspective of uh, the territorial claims and yet at the same time you have rhetoric that we will reclaim these these territories back uh why i am i'll, I'll relate it to my an academic way of doing things is what happened in in march april onwards 2020 is that uh since i speak to a lot of pakistani academicians uh, again settled again both in the us and uh uh journalists settled across pakistan uh america and europe uh i had four or five of uh, my friends saying what's up from the indian side uh, is there something about to happen uh it's it struck me uh, only after the galwan thing had happened now why i'm saying it because you had a big terrorist attack in in may where two indian army officers were killed and that's where there is another talk of a surgical strike uh, to be conducted in, inside i'm not saying it was a decision but there was a good rumor mongering uh, going on that you have indian officers being killed you already had two surgical strikes you should be planning the third one and that's where you have a big troop mobilization across the ladakh china border why yeah so what 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 also happens simultaneously is that these people i've been talking to there is this rumor that uh india is doing something and then you have the chinese mobilizing on that side and finally in june you have that trigger uh the trigger was not uh big enough to say that it was an open belligerence in a way that the yes we had killings uh, brutal killings but at the same time uh i would say they were kept uh, say they were they were tactical in nature uh, weapons were not used there were these clubs with barbed wires which were used so the threshold was deliberately kept beneath a certain level and now there's a debate that whether this was a tactical move on part of the western theater command or whether this was something ordered by beijing i'm not going into that but definitely this thing comes immediately after uh, immediately after the the rumor in the indian side that indians are about to mount, mount a surgical strike on the pakistani side of the administered kashmir and on top of that there are some good uh, again undercurrents that the way the pakistani and the chinese military officials have been uh, operating and have been conducting their relationship it's quite intermeshed uh i think in the last 2 3 years there has been a greater synergy uh and this also feeds back with this indian uh, narrative that we are ready for a two front war we might do a two front war if needed so you see uh this this self fulfilling prophecy which the indians and i think i think in 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 that way uh the the the, the ladakh the galwan incident also uh, uh partially or or in a very informal way proves that uh from what the indians perceive that uh, a two front thing could be in the making so this is what was understood uh, i know it's something which has not been uh, uh, debated or or discussed uh, but but this is what i could gather from a tactical point of view from a regional point of view i'm sure aman has some interesting global insights and uh, i would love to hear him so i gave a regional insight into uh, the the scheme of things which i noticed from my own sources from my own personal reading of the incident but yes ladakh should be seen as something which is now sandwiched between between a, a two front strategy uh and uh it's it's if you see kashmir as how it's seen by india especially the new maps 
so both china and pakistan uh, they are and the way you, you also see how how kashmir has been reduced to uh, it's its original geographical form it's like they they, they show it as just 10% of the entire thing so the new focus definitely is uh, ladakh and the way china and pakistan are are conceived by by india so it's 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 a way to say that uh, uh india in a way was talking about the two front war increasingly 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 and it was something the chinese also gave some sort of inkling that this could happen if you do something on that side of the border so that's how i end it yeah. thanks thank you so much for that and i think that that has a perfect segue into uh, aman's idea as to um, how this looks at beyond just the regional and looking at it from the global so aman over to you thank you arjun and pratik and um you know to tufts and the the epic conference um it's it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about india china um and you know thank you to all of you who are up late or getting up in the morning whether in the west coast or in south asia or or in europe um uh, thank you for tuning in um so my remarks i think um uh, i think yes are are sort of contrasting with pratik in a very interesting way that we come at this from two very different angles um you know my perspective is of being someone who studies india who is indian and you know who looks at indian foreign policy but is based in dc and so there's a naturally a um a, a different sort of perspective that comes in and it's really interesting to see how um you know you can combine those two so i really commend arjun and 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 uh you know the organizers for getting the two of us to to you know share insights and always interesting to learn from pratik and and you know the sources and the conversations he has um so for me let me proceed on on sort of a four part you know and i'll i'll get it, it done in within 5 minutes i hope and then i want to you know hear from the you know the the people in the room on questions they have and directions they want to go um but yeah you know i'll do four parts i'll just do a very brief history of of you know what's happened in gawan and in the eastern ladakh um what the disengagement agreement is uh from my understanding um where things can go from now specifically on disengagement and then where things can go in the broader india china relationship and then i can sort of include um what factors about you know us um pakistan other countries um like Japan and Australia and the quad you know how those fit feature in that last segment um so i think you know everyone's eyes have been on on ladakh for um for for uh, a while now especially since june but you know this crisis dates back to around april or may um where you know we had exercises that were happening in tibet in the chinese and uh the thought being that you know troops were moved very quickly from that exercise in order to undertake um this kind of operation in eastern ladakh um to date i think pratik has given us well i think pratik has given us a lot of good factors of why china was interested in undertaking a maneuver like this uh but to this date i mean if you talk to indian strategists you'll get a very different answer on why this has happened so much so that india's external affairs minister ashish shankar says we don't have a good answer on why china decided to do this but that they did this um and that this you know kind of activity was undertaken um in eastern ladakh and so you know what you have is um sort of multiple ingresses across multiple points in eastern ladakh obviously pangong so which we you know pratik brought up um Dep, you know depsang which uh, arjun mentioned um galwan valley where the unfortunate incident of june 15th took place as well as a couple of other areas you know gogra hot springs and demchok um and these are sort of the areas in which you've seen china sort of ingressing or attempting to ingress in multiple areas um and you know you've seen uh military talks happen um this is the traditional way in which um decisions are or discussions are happen is the commander sort of meet and figure out you know what uh what is causing the standoff and move on that's what happened i think very briefly there was a similar standoff in in the other side of the india china border and in, in sikkim in nakula and then you know the commanders met they just engaged and things moved on there was a hope that that was what would happen in um in in ladakh as well it didn't happen again because there were multiple ingress points but also because um you know there there seemed to be a coordinated aspect to to how china was uh moving in into eastern ladakh um and so you know you have uh lots of military talks and a lot of uh diplomatic talks you had lots of diplomats taking part in military talks um and an agreement was first reached right just before the galwan valley incident that indian and chinese troops would disengage at galwan 
Um, and then the Indian side story is that they went to uh, investigate whether the disengagement was going on um, as required or as needed and found that there was a Chinese camp and, and Chinese sort of soldiers in areas that they shouldn't have been. Verbal disagreements escalated to physical disagreements led to the kinds of brutal um, violence that Pratik discussed with barbed wires on sticks and, and, and you know, um, the deaths leading to the deaths of 20 uh, Indian soldiers and at least four, um, if not more. I think China has been very intentional about keeping casualty deaths uh, limited. And, you know, as people like uh, Professor M. Taylor Fravel at MIT talk about, they haven't, you know, they, they took so long to release um, military casualties from the 1962 Sino Indian War that we may never know. Um, for, for a couple of decades, um, what the true casualty number was on Galwan. Um, and, you know, since then you've seen um, both sides kind of dig in. You saw India launch a counter operation to perceived Chinese ingresses in the south bank of Pangongso, uh, you know, securing the, the ridge height, the heights um, in, in the mountain areas on the south bank and the Kailash range. And you've seen them sort of dig in for uh, a large part of the winter. You know, you, you saw that there were constant communications happening. There were core commander meetings. There were, you know, the working mechanism sort of meetings at the diplomatic level. Um, you had the meeting between the external affairs minister and the defense ministers of both sides in Moscow in September. Uh, but really there was a sense that this crisis was not going away. Um, you've got this now announcement in February of the disengagement at Pengongso. Um, there's been some discussion, if you haven't seen the interview with General Y.K. Joshi, um, you know, the, the Northern Commanding Officer um, there who spoke to a couple of media channels, he sort of describes what he thinks um, happened and, and why the operation on the night of 29th and 30th August to secure those ridge lines in the South Bank of Pangongso may have been uh, something that, that changed the game uh, for India. That's his perspective. And, you know, he's on the ground and, and has shared that perspective uh, in, in the news media. So that's, you know, uh, available to us in the public domain. Um, and, you know, on, on first sight, it does seem like that disengagement is taking place. Um, independent sources have verified that Indian and Chinese troops have disengaged at Pangong So, that there is a understanding, the kinds of misunderstandings that took place or miscommunications that took place in Galwan aren't happening in Pangong. And uh, the biggest signal that disengagement worked in that one specific area uh, of Pangong So is that um, per the agreement, um, 48 hours after the disengagement was to be complete, both sides would have another core commanders meeting. And they had that core commanders meeting, the 10th meeting of core commanders. And so we know that the disengagement of Hengong so has taken place uh, successfully and, and to the contentment of both sides. However, the crisis is not really over yet. Um, and that's partly because of what Arjun said here, which is that you've seen a lot of standoff points still yet to be disengaged. And I'll just focus on one, which is Depsang, because it aligns very neatly with what Pratik said. Um, and the issue with Depsang is that it's the only, the, the area north of Depsang is the only place in which the kind of fears and the kinds of interests that Pratik mentioned with China and Pakistan become truly relevant. It's the only place where physically India, uh, uh, sorry, Chinese and Pakistani troops can collude if they wanted to do that. It is the only place by which um, China is afraid that India can use the Depsang planes as a launch pad to undertake that kind of operation that Pratik mentioned, the fears that maybe Beijing had of um, the political statements will take back Oxide Chin or will take back troops that areas that um, you know are under Chinese or Pakistani control. Depsang planes, the way the geography is uh, suitable to mechanized warfare. Um, that seems like the place where China would be interested in making sure that there's nothing happening untoward uh, to challenge its own territorial uh, integrity and its own territorial claims as it sees it. Um, and so that is going to be one of the more complicated areas in which this disengagement is going to go on. And I wouldn't be surprised if that part, that particular part of, um, you know, where um, India and China and Chinese troops are continuing to sort of um, face off and there isn't access for Indian troops to areas they used to go to before. Um, that takes a lot of time to, to disengage. We'll see, um, you know, there's very little public information on how these diplomatic meetings, you know, go on as we should. We were surprised when the February uh, decision of disengagement came about. It may be that this engagement is on the cards, but um, the way in which their vested complicated interest in Depsang in particular uh, should leave us to believe that this crisis is not yet over and, you know, any premature celebrations that one side has prevailed over the other 
uh, and I think both sides have been guilty of this after the, um, after the Pangong uh, Lake disengagement was announced, uh, neither side has won yet, neither side has lost yet. And there's a, there's a, you know, a significant way in which this crisis can go forward. In terms of paths forward, um, I'll just you know, speak here and then I'll conclude, is that I think we are now at a point in which India and China relations will not go back to normal. Indian side, uh, Indian ministers and diplomatic functionaries have said that out loud. I think um, Chinese um, sides, even if they haven't said that publicly, probably believe that. Um, you know, I think India has been now very sort of direct about the way in which the boundary has now become the core issue. Uh, within the India-China relationship. It wasn't since uh, the uh, agreement and the visit between uh, when Rajiv Gandhi visited Deng Xiaoping. Um, that era, I think, is fundamentally over. Just as you're seeing, you know, there's lots of discussions about how the, how the Kissingerian era of uh, in US-China relations are over. I think the Rajiv Gandhi-Deng era might be over in, in India-China relations as well. Um, Vijay Gokhale, former ambassador of India to China, uh, Vijay Gokhale and former foreign secretary has a very interesting paper on how um, you can start to build, build back that trust. And he sees you know, a desire and a need for uh, both sides to sit down and have frank conversations um, and, and you know, recreate some of the informal summits in which there can be, as we saw in Anchorage yesterday or today, uh, an airing of the grievances and a very sort of public discussion on where things are going. Um, I think that's one path forward. I have a little bit less faith in the informal summits leading to any breakthroughs. Uh, in fact, I see if the informal summits, which were meant to clear the air between India and China about issues are around the world, could not have broken um, the issues that have come about so far and have led China to undertake the kind of military actions that it did. I don't see why they would be different anytime now. Uh, to be fair, there were only two informal summits and so more can help, but um, I think there's fundamentally very little trust between uh, India and China at this point forward. And that's something that they're going to have to grapple with moving forward. I think that lack of trust implicates everything else in the relationship. So whether or not China believes that the border should be central to the relationship or not, I think the reality is that it's going to be. I think you'll see it from India and the economic side of things, as Arjun talked about. Um, I think the trade deficit is going to become a very significant part of the relationship uh, as, uh, you know, uh, Indian sort of uh, officials have said over the last few years that uh, the trade deficit with China is unacceptable politically and not just statistically. Um, I think on tech, you'll see, you know, a lot of issues come up and, 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 you know, there are directions which we can talk about that as well. But fundamentally, you know, what I just want to leave the conversation with right now is there are very few paths back to business as normal in India-China relations moving forward. Um, and I think in that sense, um, you know, you have these kind of complications come up on issues like Quad, issues like Indo-Pacific, that lack of trust uh, continues to pervade, um, you know, uh, India-China relationships as India continues to align with countries. Um, you know, uh, China has been one country that has undertaken alignments at pivotal points in its history, uh, pivoting to the USSR during the early parts of the Soviet Union, and then pivoting to the United States during the Kissingerian era of, you know, the Kissingerian sort of model. Um, they've, they've tilted as, you know, um, leaders in Beijing and thinkers in Beijing likes to talk about. I think um, as you see India starting to tilt, uh, you'll see some of that discomfort starting to show when, when there's trust uh, very low. And, and I think, you know, India, it's in India's interest to continue to uh, maintain its engagements with, with other powers and other countries uh, to secure its own uh, national interests above all. And so multi-alignment as the external affairs minister calls it, or, um, you know, strategic autonomy. Um, you heard, you know, Ambassador Shivshankar Manon talk uh, recently, if you haven't seen the discussion that he had on US-India relations, I, I encourage you to do that. He said, I think it very aptly, that the Quad helps India maintain its strategic autonomy. Uh, and I think that, you know, is going to be the hallmark of how India sees its relationships with other powers as the trust deficit in China becomes uh, to an all-time low. Um, and I think that's going to be a further complicating factor that, you know, it's just going to continue to, to um, uh, be a central focus within the India-China relationship. So let me stop there. Um, I've kind of laid out, I think, a lot of the issues that come up. Um, I haven't laid out any policy recommendations moving forward because I think things are still so fluid. But we can talk about that as, as people want to if there are questions about you know, where things can go and, and, and what happens from now on. Um, but let me turn it back over to Arjun now and, and then we can move on to Q&A. 
Thanks. Thank you so much, Aman, for that. And for those who have had, who will have a chance to please read his article to the South Asian Voices, I think he's also outlined that really well um, as to the points of contention, including Dev Zang. So thanks so much, Aman, for that really insightful opinion. Uh, as people sort of get their questions in order, I had a question that I wanted to get the ball rolling with so that you know we can connect the border conflict to um, the other dimensions of this conflict as well. So one question I had was, um, what do you think is the causal link? Has the India-China border conflict fueled the economic and political and social rivalry between these two countries? Or is it the other way around where the longstanding conflict has been hotly manifested in the form of a border conflict? And uh, feel free to come off mute and go for it. Pratik, do you want to go first or shall uh, I take Yeah, I think Aman, Aman, you should go first and then I can add, yeah. Sure. Um, so, you know, from my understanding, I, I, I don't think that one begat the other, um, whether that, you know, the, the lack of sort of um, issues on the border or lack of progress on sort of del delimiting and finding sort of a final solution on the border led to, you know, economic sort of uh, steps being taken or vice versa that, you know, you, you, you've seen this. I think since 2008 um, and 2009, but I think really 2008 and the, and the um, financial crisis, you've seen India and China in, in both sides yeah. of, you know, um, in, in, in both the border areas and in other areas of the relationship, those tensions have started to mount. And I think it hasn't been uh, something where one begat the other. I think tensions have been growing in that relationship throughout. I think when you talk to um, a lot of the initiatives that, um, you know, India is starting to feel worried about or, you know, concerns about Chinese, concern, Chinese aggression or, um, you know, Chinese assertiveness uh, start to come out. Um, 2008-9 uh, starts to sort of be a, a really good point in which you can start to look at where the history of that comes into play. Um, the rising trade deficit, the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the desire to challenge Indian territorial integrity. I, I think Beijing knew what it was doing. I don't think there was any conversation or I don't think there was any confusion about the fact that a China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that cuts through territory that India claims was something that they overlooked. Um, and, and so, you know, you had these things build up. You had the launch of successive standoffs along the border, be it 2013, 2015, Doklam in 2017, Eastern Ladakh now in 2020. Um, I think all of these things in, in, in multiple domains of the relationship, the stress has been growing. And I think with um, the seriousness of what has happened in Gawan, I think we shouldn't underestimate just how serious um, uh, you know, of a moment that was that the first casualties in 45 years happened in, in, in Gawan. Um, that, you know, it, it started to affect all parts of the relationship. And I think India sees it in that very particular way is that, you know, um, the challenges along the border means that, you know, uh, the entire relationship has now become um, derailed. There's no, we can deal with the border separately and then let's, you know, continue to do economic engagements. Let's continue to do trade. Um, you, you, you've seen that, you know, it's affected everything. Um, but, you know, let me, let me also just go back before the border. You know, some of the things that China's challenged India on is, is not just an economic sort of border. It's been nuclear surprise group and the India's membership there. It's been on counterterrorism and the listing of Masood Azhar. Um, India's felt, I think, continuously and, you know, over a long period of time that China has been challenging Indian interests, not just bilaterally, not just multilaterally. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, not just on border, not just on econ, but in all of these areas. And so, you know, given that background, when you have a, you know, an issue like what happened in Galwan take place, um, there isn't, you know, a, this is because of, you know, our trade deficit with China and there was suspicions. It's a lot of things that have been building up over time in this bilateral relationship that, um, that, that really haven't uh, been addressed, I think, in, in these informal summits, or if they were addressed, they weren't addressed to the point that uh, they, were, um, they were addressed to the satisfaction of both sides. And so I think that's why you've seen um, when an incident like what happened at Gawan happened and what everything else happened in Eastern Ladakh, you've seen the relationship deteriorate to a point at which I don't think this, you, you can't go back to business as normal. Uh, but Pratik, please jump in. Yeah, so I yeah, so Aman has definitely laid out uh, the contours, and I'll just add a bit to it, which is that uh, uh, economically, let's be very honest, the the scale of the Chinese uh, economy or 
and, and and if you compare the indian and the chinese economy it's very different and that also reflects in uh, the fact 21 that 22 this is this is a break yeah Yep, sorry about that. You can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 saying that uh, it reflects in 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 the volume of the China India trade. It has not really been affected. In fact, you see more and more Chinese cars uh, running on the Indian streets. This is this is a surprise I I saw and uh, in 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 the last few months uh, being in India. So economically, it will uh, function the way it is. It's just that the government will choose to not make a noise about it. And if there is some noise, uh, there is some, I would say, uh, shallow rhetoric like don't buy the Chinese lamps or don't buy the Chinese lights. That's there to, I would say, satisfy, I think, probably a few, uh, you know, 100 million, uh, say, potential voters. Because at the end of the day, you, you must understand that India is a democracy to an extent that you are answerable on, on a lot of accounts. And why I, I link it to uh, the political side of, of Galwan that uh, the the killings uh, of, of... Now, what, what I'm stressing at is if you... If you captures this this impact on on the political moods national political moods uh in in china this did not become an issue it it it, it, it did not it did not appeal to the nationwide sentiment because uh the government was definitely managing all the things but but it never seeped into the mass consciousness it must have been to the extent that what happens to the soldiers who who, who died and who have not been given those honors and that's where the chinese accept it but on the Indian side, being being a, a democracy, even if you call it a notional democracy, because uh, there are uh, more and more voices which which call it one. Uh, but it's it is a democracy to an extent that it is answerable to the fact that how how on the earth were were these people killed? Why how how did the soldiers get killed? Now this sets the political mood uh, in in a very different uh, spiral, and this is something which Nehru two-faced is his his decision to and and i'm all, i'm also linking it to to the second part of the question of of uh, this this whether it's a continuum of the old uh, rivalries now yes nehru hid it from from the indian masses because he wanted some amicable arrangement so five years from 1954 to 1959 nehru chooses not to tell the indian audience and in 1951 the hell breaks loose in the Indian political circles. And that's for the first time the opposition is challenging Nehru that you were lying to us. And in such a domestic pressure, because he is answerable, he feels he's answerable and the opposition is so strong that he has to mount a forward policy. Or if you consider today that you have that mood, which is so strong that being, being, being a constitutional democracy, you have to be answerable for all, 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 all the lives which have been uh, uh, taken. So in that way, uh, you cannot uh, glide the way China or Pakistan can, especially the Chinese, because there's no questioning of, uh, you know, I'm not saying it in, in a very negative way. It's just that there are certain policies which are not informed by the popular mood. But in India, it becomes extremely difficult on, on how you conduct your policies. And there have been episodes that, yes, popular moods do drive, uh, you know, the government's and this is this is a time when the government is finding very hard because it has to sustain the economic momentum of of the india china relationship so the trade continues but yes as aman has said it's a very difficult time uh and i would say it's also a time when india's strategic autonomy which it believes it has uh takes a very different momentum in a way that you, you exercise your strategic autonomy by buying weapons from both the Chinese, from both the Russians and the Americans. That's how you, you, you express yourself as, as responding to the Chinese and uh, certain things which Indians do as a response to China. But I, I'll end by saying that the irritants which both the nations have, I think, uh, have been have been there. But I would still say that this this parallel between say. Uh, not uh, uh, adding to what Aman said that not not allowing the Masood Azhar issue to be taken up seriously by 
and linking it to india support for dalai lama i think that's a very i would say not uh, you know that's not appropriate comparison which the chinese might be making because dalai lama might be might be a, 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 a you know a spiritual figure but he's more or less i would say you know it's it's not as aggressively appealing to to what's happening in tibet we, we don't know what's happening in tibet first of all but on the other hand i think nasuda sir becomes a very different so so but but the way both nations have understood each other and also linking it to uh, i'll i'll just i have some ways to link this with the history where when nehru was 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 confronted on the chinese border uh, india china border and the chinese insistence that the mcmahon line should be changed i think nehru uh, yeah nehru stuck to to the fact that uh even the british even if the british did not come to india uh, mcmahon would have been the natural border but then his insistence on sticking to certain imperial uh, terminologies that also got rubbed the chinese on the wrong side so yes it's it's more of an ideological thing which has now manifested so well into the power politics that it's very difficult as aman says to to go back it will be a very difficult time to trust as well there may be tactical things but nothing on sort of some strategic realignments no and let me let me just jump in and say one thing about and a very important point that pratik raised which is on public opinion and the sharpening of public opinion against china i think india today ran a, a mood of the nation survey and and found that public opinion on china is is at an all time low but i think more seriously you know we always talk about anyone who's followed india knows how um pakistan has been deployed domestically in order to galvanize domestic politics um i think for the first time and i don't know if it's happened yet in any meaningful way but i think for the first time i uh, the, the visuals of tvs china made tvs being broken by regular ordinary indians or or you know the kinds of vitriol that came about around china after what happened in galwan uh signals a little bit that you know for the first time china is entering the popular consciousness in a way that i think and i don't think they're comparable but i think when i say that i don't mean it lightly that in a way that i think only pakistan has been indian domestic politics um or indian domestic public opinion and so how that manifests is going to be a very interesting sort of challenge and pratik has you know laid out some historical parallels historical comparisons um and some you know points of concern or or just you know points of uh, observations with which we should look forward to so uh don't want to underestimate that you know public opinion and and that sort of if i can bring the academic sort of side of things even if if pratik won't uh because of the way that he thinks um you know there's a whole history of uh, or a whole research agenda of how domestic public opinion and domestic politics influences foreign policy and you know what chi- what happens in china uh in indian domestic politics will be sort of another area of study for uh for people in that regard because it's it's one of those ways in which it's enter public opinion in a very significant way and i don't think it might leave just because there's this engagement at the border now or if there's further disengagement at the border in the future so thank you so much both of you for that really insightful answer we have a question from atre atre you want to come off mute um i had a question um and i was just curious to understand like like india and china still share like a good economic relationship despite china changing like what it means perhaps in the popular consciousness of being populist um i was trying to understand what has happened since 2008 that has made china regress on like perhaps its attitudes towards india like what are the main incentives for them despite like great economic partnerships to um stop india in for example some international institutions or have to territorial conflicts which earlier didn't exist or earlier were like historical fiction because of their relevance like excite in for all of its relevance is not that important um so like what were the key incentives that changed this relationship in 2008 2009 and how does this help china if at all because like as you said like if the if the way they've been th- th- if the if the way they've been thought about in the popular consciousness is changing it's not good for their trade it's not good for their overall country's economic health if that's what they care about but it's also not good about their reputation so is this even good power politics thank you um let me let me try and answer i mean i don't think there's a there's a very direct answer so after i apologize it may not be sort of like uh, the most satisfying answer Uh, but there are a couple of things that you know you can point to um so you know i think i think you you've captured the duality a little bit correctly that 
you know, India, China relations, even in 2020, even in the midst of the pandemic and the ongoing crisis at the border, China was India's largest trading partner, overtook the United States. Um, India's still taken steps to limit, you know, Chinese investment in, in technology or, you know, Chinese sort of uh, government procurement from China has been limited. But, you know, even despite all of those steps, China remains pretty significant. But I think two instances, uh, one that is, you know, very recent that I can say, and then I can go into the 2008-9 kind of perspective, is that, you know, uh, even despite what's been going on, um, with the growth in trade between the two countries, India has felt that it's always been lopsided. So if you look at the testimony that um, took place before the Lok Sabha, the, the Indian parliament's lower house uh, external affairs committee, there was a report on India-China relations and you know trade deficit features very directly. It's a pretty sharp allegations of Chinese dumping, Chinese non-tariff barriers to Indian goods. You've heard India's, India's external affairs minister say, you know, if we look at India pharmaceutical exports to other countries and the kinds of successes that Indian, you know, tr Indian pharmaceuticals have, um, we should be looking at something in China that is much beyond what we have. And the only explanation is Chinese non-tariff barriers or Chinese sort of, you know, uh, other sort of Chinese blocks before, you know, India can sort of be competitive in the Chinese market. But looking again at 2008, nine, I mean, you know, you, you see that as being a, a Significant. I, I don't want to overstate, you know, uh, because we, we don't have all of the answers. But, you know, again, 2008-9 is the time in which, you know, now we're starting to see the ways in which the Deng Xiaoping mantra of, you know, bide your time and, you know, keep your head down um, has kind of gone away for these opportunities once in a century. Uh, that mantra that came around in, in Hu Xintao and now in Xi Jinping um, era, I think, you know, that uh, underscores why in which China is being uh, a bit more active and a bit more assertive in asserting its own, what it sees as its own national interest, it's seeing as its own um, ways of engaging the world. You see the Chinese um, military science document that was just translated and released by, um, you know, the the Air, uh, Chinese Air Force Studies think tank here in the U.S. Um, I'm forgetting the exact name, but it's a Chinese military academy um, for for military science. You know, released a, a whole understanding of how it looks at um, its geopolitical frontiers, and you know. It, for the first time expands it out to, you know, to the Western Indian Ocean and then, you know, the Pacific uh, in ways in which, you know, it's China sees those opportunities manifesting uh, over the next, you know, few, few decades. And those opportunities once in a century are going to manifest if China looks at, you know, its, its periphery not as ending at Nepal or, you know, the border with India, but as the Northern Indian Ocean and the Western Indian Ocean and the Gulf and then going towards the Pacific. And so they have their own, they will call it that, but they have their own conception of the Indo-Pacific, you know, that, that stretches from the, from the Western Indian Ocean all the way to the Pacific. And, and they're very much thinking of opportunities in, in, in that style and in, in that sense and in that geography. And so when you look at it, you know, that way, you can start to understand why China has started to feel the need to be more actively engaged in preserving its own interest and sometimes at the cost of partners, you know, entities like India. Um, but, you know, again, India will always sort of, you know, uh, uh, come back to the point that, you know, how was it and why was it that when India was airing its concerns and was, you know, bringing them up, that they weren't really addressed. And there's a, a million reasons that we can come up. They didn't think of India as being, uh, you know, powerful enough to challenge them so India can keep complaining. But, you know, as long as we keep complaining about Masood Azhar and NSG, we don't really have the tools. And that's maybe what Beijing thought. Maybe Beijing thinks that India is irretrievably in the camp of the United States on the Quad, which is a, you know, a misunderstanding if that is on Beijing's part. But, um, you know, maybe that's part of the reason that they start to take actions that challenge Indian interests, because they know that no matter what, India is now in the camp of the West and it's not coming back. Um, we don't have the answers to that just yet, but, you know, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about, at least that, you know, how maybe China's perceptions of, of global engagement and global sort of, um, you know, uh, how it thinks about the world has changed since 2008-9 and, and how that affects India in some, some significant ways. Uh, just a small addition to uh, this, this uh, Atre's question, uh, to, to what Atre asked, it's that uh, uh, 2007 and onwards, uh, there is an increasing realization in, in the Indian foreign policy circles of this new concept called uh, string of pearls. And that's such a, say, uh, you know, such an interesting, it, it catches, catches the Indian attention that uh, the Chinese could be uh, uh, surrounding the, the, the subcontinental peripheries through their investment projects or their port building activities 
and also through their interest in 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 elections in south asian countries which let's not discuss how they are held and uh, they have some interesting ways of electing presidents and uh, dispossessing them uh, through different actors involved uh, maybe anyone <laughs> but but the fact that there were now multiple actors uh, who who were taking interest in south asian elections on top of that you have port building activities uh, and that that came as such a synchronized act and that were endorsed by the us defense of department reports or the booz allen hamilton and these think tanks who were shaping and this is this is where when uh, the indian think tank foreign policy circles are also increasingly aligned with uh, the global think tank circuits because that's the time of uh, the nuclear deal and that's where we are exposed to to a uh, global opinion and some uh, sexy terminologies and i think string of pearls all these things they just you know charge up the indian uh, uh, mood uh, i'm not saying it's true it's not true but then this this whole perception that everything is coming so synchronized from the chinese that also feeds back into uh, which does not say that it was not there but then uh, it it was conceptualized in a way that uh, It, it 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 did catch uh, the eyes and ears of the policy making thank you so much for that uh, we have a question from uzair uzair do you want to come off mute and ask the question yeah thanks arjun also i apologize this could be was on a train but um, my question to both of you is you know this weekend there was a security dialogue about this and i thought it was very interesting because Both Prime Minister Ram Chandran and the Chief of Staff categorically said that Pakistan was ready for a lasting peace with India. They were up to India to make the first move, and this comes after a ceasefire agreement was. Is that your voice is breaking? Would you want to send it in to the chat? I think your voice is uh, is cutting off. You might want to send it through the chat, and I can uh, read it out as well. Does that work? Great. Uh, we have a question from uh, Yanis from Greece. Would you want to come off mute? And is that you can? I can do your question right after this. So uh, hello, uh, thank you for very very thank you for your for your very interesting presentations on the subject. So my question regards. Uh, the india's relations uh, with the us and russia so india has a uh, has for decades uh, developed a close defense relationship with russia buying russian military equipment and still does at the same time it has been getting closer and closer to the us and it it seems that currently it is laying the foundation for a closer military relationship with the united states so does india feel that it has to choose between the US and, and Russia considering that Russia is also getting closer to China that is it willing to sacrifice its relationship with with the Russian government in order to align with with the, with the US thank you yeah that is a that is a good question so arjun um we do you want to club together uh, uzair and I think I just saw another question from Aniket come in or do you just want to still go one by one? I'm happy to stay a little bit over because but I know Pratik may have to go so just let me know how you prefer things to proceed. So I'm still waiting for Uzair's question so we can tackle this first one and then we can do Uzair and Aniket's question probably together. Um, and I'm perfect. I'm happy to stay on for longer as well and those who can as well we might be about 10 minutes over but feel free to drop off any time. Thank you. Sure sounds good. Uh Pratik you first or shall I? You're on mute. Yes, I'll be very quick. I'll be very quick. So yeah, first of all, uh, let's consider the state of the Russian economy as well. Like they they are dependent on heavily dependent on 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 exporting uh, uh, weaponry. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, the military relationship with the Chinese uh, between the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, yes, it's it's taking again. I'm not a researcher on that, but from the limited information I, I gather is that. it's not too rosy considering the fact that uh, the chinese have stolen russian technologies and reversed engineered some of their things so there is a reason to to be wary of that and thirdly uh, there is 
uh, additional reason for the Russians to diversify their exports uh, from the perspective that what you see happening in Central Asia, the Russians are not oblivious to the fact that the way Chinese have uh, made inroads into the Central Asian, which the Russians consider as some sort of a strategic backyard. So all these things have to be factored in before stating that the Russians and the Chinese are pally or Indians are uh, Indians need uh, Indians need to have different sources. So I think yes, we have a very interesting mix and match of things. Uh, a very uh, a patchwork. If you especially see the Air Force. I mean, who who buys uh, you know this handful of of Rafals and then looks for different uh, air platforms? So uh, it's 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 funny in a way, but it's also it also uh, 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 represents uh, the the need to diversify uh, in a way to to signal everyone that look, we'll buy your stuff. Don't forget us. So we have to consider these these factors in mind. Um, that's a that's a really good sort of perspective from. Uh, Pratik, and let me just build on it. So, um, Yanis, your question is, I think, one that I've started to think about a lot, and 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 you know, I'm, I'm starting to sort of wonder the where the direction of this can can go. Um, but fundamentally, again, it comes down to a really complicated set of push and pulls that um, you know prevent India, in particular, from sort of saying, "I'm going to just completely break my relationship with." either the US or with Russia and just sort of, you know, uh, decide which way I'm going to go. It's not that, that, that kind of a choice, uh, you know, is, is just not in the cards because, um, you know, the Indian military still depends on Russia, uh, maybe not as much for New York procurements, but for ongoing servicing, for ongoing parts. There's a reason why Rajnath Singh made a trip to Moscow in the middle of a pandemic in September to make sure that there's going to be steady supply of defense equipment from Russia. Uh, and it's because they are afraid that, you know, um, not only will um, that equipment be slowed down because of the pandemic or other things, but because there is a growing alignment between the United, between Russia and China. Um, and that alignment comes, you know, because primarily you know, because of the state of global geopolitics. The United States has made and named and shamed and, and you know, publicly identified Russia and China as strategic competitors if, all the way from the 2018 national defense strategy to you know, 2017 national, uh, nat national security strategy to the interim you know, uh, national security guidance that came out from the Biden administration, the thread of Russia and China being strategic competitors of the United States continues to you know, be. And so if Russia thinks of, you know, a, a country in the world that, you know, it shares its, you know, this kind of scorn from the United States, you know, it finds a friend, finds a sort of a convenience. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an, it's a partnership that is increasingly building um, because of shared interests. It's not just because of, you know, um, uh, a, a desire to sort of, you know, come together because they're in each other's neighborhoods increasingly and there's, uh, you know, desire. It is a shared sort of interest now because of how the United States has approached um, the United States, approached Russia and China. For India, you know, it's going to be a very sort of interesting um, few months ahead, especially as it comes under discussion for sanctions, possibly by the United States on its acquisition of the S-400 missile system. Um, so, you know, I know I will be and Pratik will be and maybe others on this call will be looking very closely at Secretary uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's visit to India and what discussions will come out of, um, you know, the the meeting of both defense ministers as well as I, I saw General, you know, Secretary Austin meeting with the Prime Minister. What what discussions come out on on S four hundred? Um, there's a lot of congressional pressure. You know, uh, the Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez, just put out a very strong statement telling you know, General Austin to speak a little bit more directly to India about, about the US's opposition to its acquisition of the S-400. Um, but you know, from India's perspective, a growing and deepening partnership of Russia and China would be probably one of the worst geopolitical realities if it were to emerge. If, if that partnership, which is increasingly growing, you know, I, I remember there was sort of a cheeky moment where someone asked Vladimir Putin if an alliance was out of the question with China and he, you know, demurred and sort of cheekily gave an answer, you know, I'm not answering one way or the other. I mean, if you ask that kind of a question in Delhi and, and have people talk at length about what a Russia-China combine alliance would look like for India's interests, it would, it would not be particularly good. Um, 
And so in that way, India feels a, a need to engage with Russia in order to try and limit as much as it can the engagement with China. Now, whether that's a realistic ability, whether India can drive wedges between Russia and China or prevent that combine from happening, um, we don't know. And you know, it will take deft Indian diplomacy to try and make sure that um, Russia recognizes its own interests vis-a-vis -vis India um, and, and places that on the competing list of priorities that Russia has in uh, its relations with the United States and China. Um, so I think there's no easy answers there, but I think from India's perspective, it is that fear of a Russia-China combine that continues to drive its engagement with Russia. Um, and that's why I think you'll see maybe in frank conversations that they have behind closed doors with the Americans trying to explain to them, look, this would be really bad for our interests. So, you know, recognize uh, we are, we have shared interests with you vis-a-vis -vis China. We are recognizing China's assertiveness as being a challenge on our own, own interest. But from our perspective, Russia is a, is a potential partner um, in how we, you know, engage with the world and not a potential uh, you know, adversary. And so you need to give us the space to be able to manage that relationship on our own terms without threatening sanctions every time we buy um, goods from Russia. And so whether A, you know, the, the, the two questions come down to whether A, India has the ability to actually um, prevent a growing partnership between Russia and China is one. And two, whether frank conversations with the United States and the deepening of partnerships uh, over 20 years now with the United States can actually make sure that India communicates to the United States its interests with Russia and whether the United States Russians listens despite very deeply entrenched, you know, desires to punish Russia for solar winds, for the, you know, the, um, the attacks on American democracy in 2016, 2020, the invasion of Ukraine, all of those things, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to uh, put the Russia and China hawks and sort of the India supporters and, and triangulate um, how that kind of works out. It's going to be a very diplomatic difficult tightrope to walk. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most complicated elements of Indian foreign policy looking forward and Indian strategy moving forward. Um, but I think there's strong strategic imperatives for why India is engaging with Russia in the way that it is. Thank you so much for that, Aman. And we have a couple of questions, but just wanted to check with both of you about uh, time, um, time being an issue. I uh, just have two, one of Uzair's question and a couple more, but we can go over them and I can club them as well. Yeah, I can stay on for about 15 minutes more. So yeah, um, maybe yeah. We can that, or you same, know, same. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. Fine. Sounds good. Thank you. So the rest of the audience, if you uh, need to drop off, please feel free to. We'll have this recorded and uh, presented on our website as well. Uh, but the question that we have is from Uzair, who asks, uh, what explains Pakistan's recent push to improve relations from India, given that the Army Chief of Staff and PM Khan have said that India will need to make the first move to create a conducive environment for talks, how will this be seen in Indian quarters? And how do you account for the timing of these statements? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll begin with this, uh, answering this. Uh, this is a routine thing, and uh, but the recent push, if, if we understand on the tactical lines, there, have been, there has been a strong push from the American side to mend uh, ties and uh, start on, on a fresh note. So, this was supposed to, uh, what, what I gather is that the ceasefire was actually supposed to be taking place by last October or September, but then certain things happened and then it, it got delayed. Uh, but there is nothing new in, in the speeches, uh, which uh, my friend Uzair mentions because, uh, and, and there is nothing uh, I would say, uh, uh, say uh, unnatural about it because any road which the Pakistani side would propose that has to go through Kashmir. And Kashmir is something which the Indians will, uh, as the time has flowed, they, they will never negotiate on, on that. There can be things like people-to-people uh, -people ties or, or better bus services, visa facilities. But uh, the fact that the Pakistani side, uh, which it feels it's, it's a legitimate demand because it, for the virtue of being in the UN, but considering uh, the, the state of ties and what's happened in, in the valley, especially in the last three decades, and the fact that there is some sort of influence which the Pakistani side can exert on, on, on Kashmir in, in, in different ways, uh, that, that speech, uh, peace always comes with, with this rider uh, of, of something happening in Kashmir, and then we'll do that. 
so i think uh, we shouldn't be reading too much into that and uh, things uh, can be changed but but yes uh, kashmir will be always and it's it's been there uh, you know since if you see the 98 a uh, composite dialogue or all other say musharraf wajpayee everything has uh, because the pakistani identity uh, is incomplete without uh, kashmir this is something which is embedded in in the way th- this the, the new nation state emerged so we have to keep that in mind the, the sensibilities and the sensitivities regarding kashmir yeah i mean i have very little to add because you know pratik has kind of nailed it um in in this regard but you know I think when when I was sort of listening to his there's question you know uh that you know peace will come as long as you know there's this movement on India's part to make a good faith effort towards peace India is very capable and uh you know frankly as they feel within their rights to say well then you make the first move on peace by you know limiting your influence on cross border terrorism and taking steps on limiting your uh support for uh organizations that engage in in cross border activities or take steps on financing um and so if we you know see that pratik's kind of uh you know s- uh, s- very smart remarks on you know how this is going to sort of just the rhetoric just continues to become this you know roundabout that each side gets on and off of okay you make the first step on this you make the first step on that um shows just how difficult it will be to you know move both sides away from um their sort of entrenched interests and and you know focus them on peace but you know again uh, i i can just speak on one thing from from india's perspective which is you know to go back to the two front kind of situation um that pratik raised at the beginning of this discussion i mean you know uh, some you know, uh, at least for me one of the things that i was looking at in particular was the fact that you know uh, um india's slowing economy has limited its resources and its ability to engage in the kind of two front planning that they were thinking of and so in that regard that is why you saw some armored divisions that were you know placed in 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 sort of the pakistani facing theater be moved to eastern ladakh so that it could be you know uh something that they could engage with china um and so you know you seen that kind of uh, crunch for resources because of indians uh, india slowing economy not just because of the covid-19 pandemic but over the last two years i think in particular 2018 and 2019 um you know you you, you that there are real implications for how india can uh can can sort of manage these um uh, these threats if it's if it's you know seeing it in that particular way and and in the way in which um it's not ready for something in which both sides of that border becomes very hot and you know 2020 was the hottest border along the LOC uh it was the year of their their first casualties along the LAC for the first time in 45 years and so a two front even if not collusive but a, a simultaneous two front um you know uh uh concern became very real for india and it found that you know the resources had to be diverted in order to make sure that um the more principally principally uh, significantly more th- um serious threat uh was handled first and and you know that i think uh, was was in eastern ladakh um and so just you know again from from india's perspective if it's going to you know uh want to have a, a very strong look at how it's going to deal with uh two very very um uh, potentially um very easily combustible border conflicts um it needs to look at a hard you know a hard look at its own resources and the ability to to uh have resources in play to address both sides of that and and i think that came into a little bit of a reality in 2020 for it. and and i think you'll see sort of um that's why i think you'll see sort of a big focus on why indian growth is going to be the big driver of whether or not it can do uh what it pursues as its interests in in world affairs starting with india pakistan and india china but all the way out um as as it tries to recover from the covid-19 pandemic it's perfect that you mentioned growth because that's sort of where our penultimate question blends in uh which is about india's response to uh the presumed failure of you know the chinese tactic of using uh loan financing so the question asks as uh, at this point what do you think should be india's stance for central and south asia economically uh is it best for india to be aligned with the west or push harder for a third bloc uh this is considering with uh limited success with the chinese policy of providing loans uh so yeah can i can i begin with it yes of course yes. yeah so basically uh india has been aligned with the west in in ways that uh in in response to the bri the americans i think i don't know the name of the program uh, aman would recall it it's i think they disbursed 500 million dollars to different 
these small states where they could potentially use it you know as a counter or potentially partner with india but the bigger problem is uh, it's it's a systemic problem and let's acknowledge it that uh, the chinese were welcomed in at least in south asia when the indian projects were being quite sloppy you announce a bridge in 1995 and you start building it in 2005 that really that really irritates and but at the same time the the other side of the big state small state relationship is that the small state also tries to play a ball game saying if you don't do this 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 uh, we might uh, look for different options and the different option is obviously china different alternative is china and we have to admit the fact that uh, the chinese have been able to deliver if you see some of their infrastructure projects i'm not getting into the commercial viability but uh, when it comes to the speed when it come to the optics of it uh, they make a big bridge and they'll name it the china friendship something like that you know they'll there's a visible chinese footprint on that so that enters the consciousness of of whoever who uses it sees it in 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 uh, other way indians uh, they do manage to do certain good things but then it it comes after so much of a uh, tough bargain for instance you see uh, all south asian nations where indians are engaged in projects some have been extremely well i'm not contesting that but then uh, you should also consider uh, delving deep into uh, a psychological kind of a relationship uh, especially dealing with a person who speaks the same language who has the same culture and then this person doing something wrong they are at a, a greater receiving end because we are more embedded into the south asian systems rather than the chinese uh, who who come who throw money uh, but they also extract their pound of flesh that's something which is realized later but at the same time the offer is too uh, generous uh, in the beginning so this is something which the indian side should be acknowledging it has acknowledged it and probably it has acted but uh, let's see how it how it pans out yeah if i can jump in here i mean i think um how india will see this is not you know sort of a aligned with the west completely or a third block or something like that i think india is going to be and in in keeping with its desire for strategic autonomy or non alignment or multi alignment pick your buzzword of choice but ultimately it comes down to flexible partnerships and so you know you'll see india i i i don't i don't see there'll be any contradiction between continuing with projects that are sustainable and under international norms like you know the asian infrastructure development bank you know the the asian infrastructure aiib bank or you know other sort of entities when the chinese are involved but i think you know you'll see one of the things that you know um i'll make two points here the first is that there are limitations to how india can compete with china on infrastructure and i think that some of the things that pratik brought up is is very real one is resources obviously um India has its own infrastructure development needs that it needs to take on and and part of that is going to be how it engages with um you know with with countries on its periphery right a, a bridge that connects uh, India through Bangladesh into its northeast is an act east project as well as an Indian domestic priority um but there are other ways in which you know there are not financial considerations why the chinese are investing in certain projects uh india can't you know go after a project in which you know china's saying We'll build you a bridge as long as you recognize us and not Taiwan. India can't offer anything to a country that is willing to take on a deal like that. Um, there's no amount of you know sustainable financing or grant money that's going to you know uh, move a country along if 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 China's prices. You know, we won't ask for any money back. Just you know, um, vote for recognize recognize us over Taiwan and and or, or what we saw in Mal. these which is you can line your own pockets you know president of maldives and we'll look the other way and and you know we'll have these infrastructure development projects that continue to take on um and so you know there are um there are sort of you know uh, areas and limitations to which um you'll have um you know you, the limitations to which india can really compete with china and so you know the investigations into the maldives you know the the former pr- president you know the ways in which chinese companies were involved in his finances there's really nothing india can do other than hope that the other side wins they start looking and investigating and they have a more you know um a more favorable tilt towards india but the second thing that i think you know and and this is something constantino xavier at brookings india i mean you should really read his work on on connectivity and and about you know us i mean india china you know maybe competition in in south asia which is you know he 
uh, I, I really like the way that he says it, which is, you know, you can't have a strategy of denial. You can't move in this globalized world anymore to say China should not be allowed in South Asia. And, you know, we will raise stern sort of, you know, uh, demarches or stern rhetoric when China starts to get involved in Nepal. But what you have to do is, is you know, compete where you can and join up with other countries where you can. And so in this regard, sometimes the West is going to be a, you know, it's going to be an interesting sort of model. You'll have uh, maybe, you know, with the United States, this vaccine diplomacy initiative that they've launched with the Quad as a way of, you know, providing service and value to the region and showing, well, you know, China promised Nepal 100,000 vaccines and promised Bangladesh, you know, if they paid for under commercial rights, we'll give them vaccines. But now through this Quad initiative and through India's own vaccine diplomacy initiative, um, it is providing these vaccines and grant basis to Bangladesh, or it's providing a billion vaccines financed by the US and Japan uh, to Southeast Asian countries. Um, you might see India pick up the pace on, you know, something that has been comatose for a while, but the Asia Africa Growth Corridor, which is an, you know, an Asian red initiative between Japan and, and uh, India. Uh, so Western countries are not involved. You know, Japan is going to be a big part of that initiative and there hasn't really been much progress, but in an area where China has been playing a bigger role, which is Africa and an area which is a strategic priority for India, um, you can have, you know, joint Asian initiatives that, that take forward there. So rather than a strategy of denial, which is saying, you know, oh, China's, you know, doing this, let's stop them from having these kinds of, you know, uh, opaque contracts or these kinds of unsustainable projects. Uh, I think India has got to move towards a strategy wherein it sets a power of example, either by itself, like it's doing with vaccine Maitri and the vaccine diplomacy campaign or through allies and partners. India doesn't have allies, so just partners, sorry. But, um, you know, with the United States, with Australia, with Japan through the Quad, or with other countries in the region, like um, Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, these countries uh, are looking for India to be more engaged in the region. And, and if they can provide a example-based alternative to um, China's activities in the region, um, that's a better strategy than just, you know, thumbing your nose and saying, oh, well, China's doing this, it's bad, it's wrong, and we should prevent it from happening at all. Um, but, but by providing value to the region, it's, 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 it's both advancing Indian interests uh, independent of China, but also vis-a-vis -vis China. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Aman and Pratik, for those really insightful remarks. Unfortunately, we won't be able to go through a few other questions that were sent in, but I really thank you both for staying slightly over time and sharing with us what has been a really insightful conversation going beyond uh, what conventional knowledge about these two subjects are and you know, really pointing out those points of con uh, those points of contention um, that even go beyond just border conflicts. Looking at economic disagreements, looking at partnership disagreements, um, like you said, Aman, I think the next step is definitely to try and build that trust. And I'm glad to host uh, conferences like these that can bring these perspectives together. So I would like to thank all of the audience for being here. I'd like to thank my friends, family, and all of the other students who are up at different times of the day. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and this concludes our first day of the EPIC Symposium. We will be moving on tomorrow, beginning with a panel. The entire schedule is available on our website, sent earlier in the chat. So uh, look at it and that's where the Zoom uh, links information will be as well. But thank you so much, Aman and Pratik, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye all, thank you.